thank you so much for joining us um, in your in vast numbers uh, for today's event on careers after the PhD in languages, cultures and societies. Um, this event is organised as a collaboration between the Institute of Languages, Cultures and Societies at the School of um, Advanced Study and the University of London's Careers Service. I'm Naomi Wales, I'm a senior lecturer at the Institute, and I'll be hosting the meeting in collabor collaboration with my colleague, uh, our Institute Manager, Cathy Collins, and also with the School of Advanced Studies Senior Careers Consultant, Liz Wilkinson, who you'll hear more from later. Um, I'm going to hand over to our Institute Director in a minute, um, who will give a longer kind of welcome and introduction, but I just want to start with some practicalities. Um, hopefully you've already seen the timetable for today, um, but following Charles Burdett's introduction, we'll have our PhD alumni panel from 2.10 to 3.15, followed by a short break. Um, then we'll have the head of the university's careers group, Dr. Kate Daubney, who's going to give a keynote from 3.35 to just before 4 p.m. And then we'll end with a session, which is with two of our current PhD students here at the Institute in conversation with our career service colleagues. And that will be from 4 till 5 p.m. Um, now, we have a very large number of attendees today, so I have muted everyone um, um, just because to make it easier to manage the event. Um, but we will um, be taking any comments and questions via the chat. So the chat is open for you to message. And that is where we'll be kind of taking comments and questions, if that's OK. Um, I should also mention we are recording today's session um, and also the, the comments posted in the chat. Um, we will anonymize these, but we may use them in our kind of future reporting and perhaps kind of research by the careers service um, in the kind of reflection on the event. Um, but just to say, if you do have any issues with that, either pop me a message in the chat or email us after the event to just say if you're not happy for, say, your comments to be included. But as I say, they will be fully anonymized in any reporting. Um, so I think that's everything on the practical side, but I will be in the background. So, you know, if you do need, if there are any issues that arise, um, let me know in the chat. Um, but as I say, um, I'll now hand over to our Institute Director, um, Professor Charles Burdett, and he is going to give um, a, a longer welcome and introduction uh, to frame today's event. So I'll stop sharing and uh, hand over to Charles. Well, thank you very much, uh, Naomi and Liz, for inviting me to say a few words to um, kick off um, the event. I see myself very much as the warm-up act um, for our panellists, uh, and what I want to say is it's going to be relatively brief. But the first thing is that if you're thinking about a subject area, then you think about its rationale, and that's the business, part of the business of the Institute. Uh, how the subject area relates to society and what kinds of postgraduate students that subject area is creating and where they're going to go. And I think it's very important to start from the beginning that postgraduate study is about preparing people to enter all different kinds of work, of which uh, continuing in academia is, uh, and is only one. Um, so I think it's, it's particularly interesting and important for us to be um, arranging an event of this kind. So I just want to say a few, uh, make a few bullet points um, that are hopefully condense um, some of the things that we talk about, uh, both among ourselves and, of course, in the seminars and conferences um, which we organise and which are intended to bring people together at all uh, different stages in the academic process and the way in which it is connected to society and to the educational landscape as a whole. So my first bullet point is narrative. Narratives are important, and I think we know that better than almost any other um, subject community. Um, the way in which they structure reality and one's um, approach to that is, is fundamentally important. They need to be thought about, they need to be contested, they need to be reformulated. Narratives are collective, and it is important if you're thinking about a disciplinary uh, subject area, what that general narrative is, how understandable it is, and uh, how it plays out visibly in the public arena. But narratives are not only collective, they're also, uh, like any kind of rationale, 
um, something that is internalized and used for individual purposes. And I think this is important for us to be uh, experimenting and talking about what it is that we do and its wider applications in a form that is uh, narratively um, uh, well constructed. Uh, on that basis, I think one of the things that we have done in a relatively um, recent past is to change the name of the Institute. We used to call ourselves the Institute of Modern Languages Research. We now call ourselves the Institute of Languages, Cultures and Societies. And that's partly to reflect the way in which the subject community is moving more and more to talk about societal implications of, uh, of, of the study of culture. But it is also to get away from a certain ambiguity. If you say modern languages to anyone within modern languages, you know what, what, what the thing is. If you say modern languages outside the community, it becomes slightly more problematic, in which you have to say, well, it's not just language. It is about the integrated study of language, culture, and society. Um, and I think this is a more literal and a more uh, closer definition of the kind of study that we do. It also implies, uh, collective, uh, it implies that when you study a language, you don't just study a language. What you do is that you study from within a particular linguistic or cultural context. And you are able to make uh, yourself uh, and others aware of the way in which reality changes from the different perspective or positionality that you adopt. Uh, and someone who's done advanced postgraduate study, of course, becomes intimately aware of the way in which reality changes from the different perspectives that one can adopt, whether temporally, spatially, geographically. And I think that is very basic to the narrative uh, of uh, languages and cultures. My next bullet point is that uh, well, I've entitled it Real World Issues. I think it's postgraduate study uh, has direct applications. It studies real world issues in real time and with future applications. It isn't about simply the present. It's also about how we think about the creation of the future. Now, in some respects, when one's talking about a humanities uh, discipline, although, of course, that shades into a social si uh, sciences discipline, you could argue that in some way its applications are indirect. Uh, I would argue that they are both. Um, and I think it's very important to think about, well, why are you doing uh, the kind of study that you are doing and how does that uh, in some way play out um, in, uh, in the way in which societies are organised? Now, it can be direct, and I think it's very interesting to look at the case studies of the Research Excellence Framework, which gives us a real sense of the uh, multitude of ways in which the study of languages and cultures does impact very directly upon um, the way in which uh, economic, uh, social, and above all, cultural uh, knowledge is created, downloaded, thought about, and, um, uh, and applied. But also, when whatever element that you are studying, so much about postgraduate study is about working on relatively complex methodological or theoretical frameworks, how you develop a greater purchase on the subject area that you are studying. And I think it's that that can have so many direct applications subsequently. Um, the way in which we think about um, the framework within which we do our studies is um, something that is uh, uh, of very direct application. A good example of this, for example, oh, sorry, uh, is the, the way in which um, environmental humanities is developing. Uh, languages and cultures has a massive role to play in the way in which we think about uh, climate change and the uh, uh, climate crisis that we are living through. My third of four um, bullet points is about topics that we study. Some of the things that, so many of the things, in fact, arguably all of what we study is um, have um, resonances uh, across society uh, culture. If we think about gender, racialization, temporality, spatiality, all of these questions in whatever format they are studied have impacts on social cohesion, security, cultural enrichment, economic well-being. 
I think it's very interesting to look at some of the work that's been done in the Open World Research Initiative to see just how that resonance of the work uh, in the disciplinary area and the wider disciplinary area resonates uh, through all uh, levels of society, uh, both nationally, uh, internationally and transnationally. I think it's very interesting that we organized a seminar on what the Open World Research Initiative has done. Uh, and it was um, really um, very enlightening to hear uh, the Russianist, uh, uh, the Russianist uh, community talking about the way in which uh, their study uh, is, enables us to think about um, the current uh, crisis in Ukraine. Just one example. The, um, the final element that I want to talk about is research. Um, so I've talked about narrative, I've talked about real world issues, I've talked about topics. And finally, and that's before one starts talking about constructing an argument, data collection, archival research, field work, semi-structured interviews, uh, engagement with the creative sector, engagement with museum curation, digital production which are the very nuts and bolts of um, the types of postgraduate study in which people are involved and which have both direct and indirect applications. So just to go back to my initial point, I think this collective thinking of the rationale of the disciplinary area is important for the visibility and public recognition of that disciplinary area, but it's also very important for the way in which postgraduates think about uh, their work and uh, are entirely self-confident about the way in which it can uh, be uh, brought to all areas of society, culture, and of course, language. And I will stop there. As I say, this was intended only to be a few words for the, uh, the goal of the event, which is, of course, our panellists. Thanks so much, Charles, for framing that event. And uh, yeah, I'm sure a lot of what we hear through the day will echo a lot of those points you've raised. Um, and I will now, as you say, we we will we're looking really looking forward to hearing from our panelists. Um, I will hand over to um, our chair for the next session. So Liz Wilkinson is uh, works here in the University of London as a senior careers consultant. Um, and she, in particular, she provides um, dedicated and very welcome support to our own postgraduate students at the school and the Institute. So I will hand over to Liz, who will be um, introducing the next panel. Thanks, Liz. So thank you very much, Naomi, and a really warm welcome to everybody. It's fantastic to be in such a big, crowded um, room, but particularly warm welcome to our six PhD alumni panellists, um, a really warm, wide range of experience. So we only have an hour, and I am relying on you all. We're going to have lots of questions. I want to make this a very interactive session. So what I've set our challenges to do, to pick up on Charles's point about narratives, is I asked them all to think about a three-minute um, summary of their PhD experience and their careers path so, since then. And we're going to work through alphabetically in the order here. So, if, Pardad, if I could ask you to uncloak and unmute to start us off and just sort of three minutes on your PhD experience and your career since then, and then we'll move on um, through the rest of our panel. After that, just to the audience, listen out. Type your questions in as you think uh, as you think of them, and then I will be moderating that and posing your um, questions to the panelists. If there's a particular panelist you want to address your question to, then just mark that in the 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 chat box, and I'll do my best to get as many of those questions across as possible. So that's the structure for our next hour. And so, Fadad, the floor is yours to give your three-minute summary of your PhD experience and your career path since then. Thank you very much. Um, I was used to dread the three-minute thesis um, competitions. But anyway, um, Yes, so I'm going to keep it boring and biographical, I think, and then I think we're going to get into it after. Um, so I came to a PhD, um, Elizabeth, in a roundabout way. Um, I actually did a PGC. So I was um, I trained to be a teacher in modern languages uh, before and then saw an advert for a collaborative PhD. 
uh, between the British Library and uh, Bristol University on the Stefan Zweig collection uh, of, of uh, manuscripts, uh, which the British Library holds for various reasons. And um, the, the way it was framed, it felt a bit more like a, a job opportunity than a, than a, a full-on uh, research opportunity, which you know, enticed me more than um, doing a whole process around developing a proposal and, and potentially trying to justify it to myself for the next three to five years as to why I've chosen this subject and who it, who it really impacts. So it justified itself. Um, anyway, long story short, I was accepted onto the program. Um, and, you know, for the purpose of this event, I cheating a little bit in the sense that I was already um, invited to do a lot of practical work within the library. Um, so my training in culture and heritage uh, happened in parallel. Um, to, to the research and the kinds of things I was doing from the beginning were um, helping to produce a catalogue for the collection uh, which involved bibliographical research as well as writing the introduction and then when you work at the library you know you're kind of asked to do a lot of um, public engagement work whether that's writing for um, lay if that's the right word audiences in, in, in blogs uh, or in my case I did um, you know a small display and exhibition um, a symposium around the anniversary of Stefan Zweig and um, um, a sort of performance, evening performance event and, and managed to kind of um, lead a lot of these things. Um, that kind of experience led me to being offered a job in, uh, as a curator in the Germanic section in European studies where I was already situated. Um, and that's kind of what I, what I do now. I'm responsible for some, some German stuff, but actually more responsible for Nordic and Scandinavian collections. Um, Briefly, what a curator does at the library is, is um, collection development. So buying things, acquiring new contemporary scholarly material and, and literary material, uh, promoting that material, um, whether that's um, through research and writing or through um, uh, engagement with um, sorts of cultural institutes or um, other kind of diplomatic uh, spaces. Um, and then there's, there's a whole research aspect. We have a um, ever more developed research development team that produces a lot of uh, calls for PhD placements and collaborative PhDs. And I currently supervise a PhD my, myself uh, on another German archive. Um, and I guess the last thing to mention is over the past three years, I've been more involved in the library's sort of commitment to becoming anti-racist, um, actively anti-racist, I think is the phrase that they use. Um, and I've actually just accepted a new job um, as the library's lead uh, for metadata issues around equity and inclusion. So that's that's my brief journey. Um, I don't know how long that was, but I hope that's given you a sense of what I do. Uh, you've started us off so very well, and immediately I can imagine people are thinking of questions. I say we will take questions for all the panel at the, when we've all gone round, but as you think of them, do feel free to type your questions into the chat box. So thank you, Pardar. That was a great start. So next up is Ellie. Hello, hi everyone, nice to uh, see so many people in a Zoom call. Um, okay, at this I, I struggled a little bit with, with putting together my narrative and my PhD and my post-PhD life, um, so I'll try to keep it to three minutes. Um, so I guess first thing, compared to uh, Pardeep, I, I went straight into my PhD after my undergraduate and master's degree. Um, I guess, yeah, quite traditional in that sense. Uh, my PhD was in Italian studies at St Andrews. Um, uh, what I was doing in those years was, of course, writing my thesis, which was about contemporary artists and writers in Rome. Uh, but I was also doing loads of other things at the same time, which I think is important to, to highlight. I was teaching. I was also presenting at conferences. I was organizing academic events. Um, it wasn't until afterwards that I understood how valuable those kinds of little jobs were. Uh, so yeah, then I finished my PhD. I had my Viva three years ago um, in March 2020, which was also when COVID appeared in our lives. Uh, and that did have an impact on my decision making. I really, really hope that that doesn't happen to anybody currently doing their PhD now. Um, but yeah, in that context, uh, the uncertainty that comes with applying for postdocs and kind of going the academic route was not something I felt able to do. I just, I didn't have the energy to do it. So I just, just started applying for jobs, which I seemed to be 
relatively well qualified for and I got one quite quickly uh, and I have no doubt that that's because of all of those other jobs that I was doing alongside my PhD which I mentioned um, so the job I got was working for uh, the Doctoral Training Alliance which is a doctoral training program for people doing PhDs in um, energy biosciences and social policy uh, which runs across a mission group of universities across the UK. I The first job I got was as an administrator on the team um, but quite quickly after I started it became clear to me and to my boss that um, my skills were valuable to the program in ways that go beyond my administration, uh, specifically my like, knowledge and my experience of doing a PhD. So after about eight months, uh, I was promoted to a high role in the team that gave me more responsibility for the training program and for designing and delivering uh, training elements, uh, like researcher skills training, basically. So I was lucky in that, definitely, but I think it's also fair to say that my capacity to progress was because I had done a PhD. Um, so then, yeah, I worked for DTA for about two and a half years, and then I actually quit last autumn, which uh, brings me closer to the present. Uh, the reason why I decided to quit was because a year or so after finishing my PhD, I started to really miss the part of myself that does research and writes. Um, and I realized that that was kind of a part of myself that I still wanted to, to nurture and to, to give time to. Um, I also feel like, whereas I said, like when I finished my PhD, I, I didn't have the energy to do kind of academic applications. Whereas after a few years outside of that system, I felt like I had, I had the energy again. And I, yeah, I uh, also kind of had like two niggles in my mind, two ideas that I wanted to develop. One, which is my um, kind of the work coming from my thesis. So I'm currently uh, developing a manuscript for a monograph based on that, fingers crossed. We'll, we'll see where it goes. Um, but then I also had, had another uh, niggle, an idea that I wanted to develop, which was the idea for a, a new research project which kind of grew out of the space between my job in researcher skills training and my PhD in languages. And this is actually what brought me to the ILCS, where I'm currently a visiting fellow. Uh, so I'm developing a project currently in the form of postdoc applications um, to carry out research into uh, the range of skills that you get from doing a PhD in languages. Um, so this event is actually like extra relevant to me in relation to that uh, as well as just getting to speak to you. Um, and yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm sure I've spoken for more than three minutes now, so, so I'll stop. But but yeah, happy to talk about any of those those things. Very but. very rich stuff, and I've already got some. And I think it's great, you know, already just from two of our speakers, we're seeing the range of both jobs, but also sort of the portfolio of activities that we see in many people after their PhD. So um, next up is Sana. So if I can ask you to unmute and share your experience. Um, hello, I'm Sana Goel. Um, I'm the Deputy and Reviews Editor at Wasafiri Magazine. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm really excited um, to hear from all of you and to be talking to you. Um, I'll just take you through my journey through the PhD and take you up to where I am now. Um, so it was actually whilst doing a PhD at SOAS that I applied and got accepted for a year long Chase, uh, that's Consortium for the Humanities and Arts, Southeast England, for those of you who don't know, um, editorial and administrative placement at Wazafiri. Um, it was a really exciting time to be at the magazine um, of international contemporary writing, um, which was turning 35 uh, that year and founded in 1984 by Dr. Sashila Nasta. Um, halfway through the internship, I made the role of digital editor, which I remained in for 18 months. Um, here I was commissioning 
marketing and editing for the website, managing the magazine's social media platforms, um, and then before taking a break to finish my thesis, um, which was on the politics and ethics of literary prizes. Um, during the PhD, which was delayed due to the pandemic a little bit. Um, I also worked part-time um, as a publicist for a year at Tilted Access Press. Um, it's a small um, press publishing translations from Asian languages, um, including last year's um, International Booker Prize winner. Um, and for all of last year, I also worked at um, Poetry Birmingham Literary Journal. I worked here part-time. It's a biannual new magazine of poetry and poetry criticism. Um, and I did some marketing and outreach work for them. Um, over the years and alongside the PhD, um, I've also been a freelancer. So writing about books and prizes for a number of publications, um, including The Guardian, The Los Angeles review of books um, and elsewhere. Um, I've judged a few prizes in the last couple of years. So the Orwell Prize for Political Fiction and um, English Pen's Pen Presents Award for translations from Indian languages. Um, I returned to the magazine last spring as deputy and reviews editor after finishing my PhD. Um, at Wazafiri, I edit the spring issue each year. Um, I commission for the website and contribute to everything sort of from editorial to events um, alongside broader organizational strategy and vision. So this is, yeah, me now, and um, I'd love to take some questions, but I think I'll, yeah, stop for now. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Sarah. Well, we're going to have questions at the end, but just as, as I think some of you will have seen in the chat box, we've had a truly fabulous question and what I expect from my Languages, Cultures and Societies PhD about, you know, that that set, um, referencing Richard Sennett about a crisis of narrative. So for those of you who aren't speaking, I invite you to um, reflect on that question so as we'll move on, on to that. But while you're doing that, I'm going to... Um, advice. I think we're next we're going to Angarad. So if I could ask you to unmute and give us your three minutes summary. Thank you. So I can see Angarad, but she's frozen. So I'll just give it a few seconds in case she's got a bit of tech buffering. Okay, what I'm going to do, Anne Garrett, is I'll come back to you. And um, if Lisa Maria, are you um, ready to speak? And then we'll come back to Anne Garrett. Thank you. Yes, I'm happy to step in whilst Anne Garrett um, figures out the, the tech issues, hopefully. So my name is Lisa Maria Muller. I'm Head of Research at the Chancellor College of Teaching now. Um, I sim uh, Similarly to Pardard, I completed a um, teacher training course at the University of, of Vienna. I'm a qualified English and Russian teacher. And I then worked in um, in two secondary schools in Austria and then also in a secondary, in a London secondary school um, in, um, well, in London, um, as it's an inner London school. And um, I then received a scholarship to complete a full time PhD and um, subsequently worked as a postdoc at the universities of Cambridge and York. In Cambridge, I worked on a large interdisciplinary project, um, working, um, uh, focusing on foreign language learning and um, at the University of York. So they, 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 they were running kind of in parallel for, for a while as I was working part-time um, for both universities. I was writing summaries of academic research articles um, for, for the OASIS database, which some of you might be familiar with, which publishes um, summaries of, um, of academic articles. And um, during that time, what uh, really occurred to me, so there were multiple things. First of all, I looked at the academic job market and um, really thought to myself that I didn't want that precarious life. I'll say it honestly. I, I enjoyed the postdocs that, um, that I was doing, but I couldn't see myself for various reasons. Um, jumping from contract to contract, from location to location, so that was one of the reasons um, why I started um, to reflect on other options. Um, and at the same time, also, I realized that um, what I enjoyed most was um, thinking about the impact of my research. 
So really trying to solve real life problems with my research skills. And during my time in Cambridge, I also completed um, the Rising Stars um, program, which was all about um, learning how um, how to have the most, how your research can have the biggest impact and and um, developing and, and making it accessible for people outside your um, your research area. And um, so I started to look at other uh, job opportunities outside academia and found um, a, a job advert for a role um, called Education Research Manager at the Chartered College of Teaching. The Chartered College of Teaching is the professional body for teachers. So some of you might be familiar with the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists or the Royal College of GPs. Well, we're basically the same thing, but for teachers. Um, so we're the professional body. And um, I now lead the research department there, which means that I work on linking research and practice. That's exactly um, what my role requires me to do. I'm still using my research skills because we do publish our own research, most notably, for example, during the pandemic, we published four reports um, looking at um, pre pre previous literature on various crises and the potential impact on student and teachers, which really helped um, in having conversations with the government who obviously had to take decisions about closing schools, providing distance learning and so on. We collect um, data from teachers about their experiences um, in the classroom on distance learning. Um, it all has um, a much more practical lens to it. Um, I, it's very focused on what I said previously, the impact on solving an issue, finding a response to um, um, quite a practical question. Um, on getting the teacher voice heard, on working with policymakers, um, supporting their decision-making processes. So in, in that way, I'm using my, definitely using my research skills, both in uh, conducting literature reviews, rapid evidence reviews, um, collecting quantitative and qualitative data, analyzing it, writing it up. Um, so some of those quite classical research skills, but on very, very different timeframes. So um, where typically in order to conduct a systematic um, review, you'd um, set aside at a minimum six months, but up to one, one and a half, um, two years. Um, for us, quite often, we can get requests in where um, we have to produce a rapid evidence review within about a month um, in order to support decision making at various levels. So that makes it very fast paced. For me, um, that works really well. Um, I enjoy that environment. I enjoy working on different projects at the same time um, and having that impact, feeling like I'm having impact on um, practice and policy and happy to answer any questions you might have. There's some great, some great things here. And I've got, uh, uh, you're already prompting some questions for me, but now I'm delighted to say we've got Angarad back in the room. So Angarad, if you want to uncloak and unmute, let's see if your internet will behave now. Sorry, Thank I'm you. trying to hotspot from my phone. So it's a little temperamental. So if I disappear, I'll try and come back. Um, so I started my PhD in 2017 at what was the IMLR. Um, I'd previously done both an undergraduate and a master's at Queen Mary University. And I think I didn't necessarily do a PhD because I wanted a career in academia. I just did it because I was really interested in the subject and I really enjoyed studying. Um, and I think some of the people I met had a very clear career goal that they wanted to kind of end up in academia, but I was open to, if it happens, if I, you know, if it works out that way, then that's great. But also, you know, I'm just doing it because I enjoy it. Um, I think, as Ellie said, um, doing other things at the same time is also really important. So I never just did one thing, even when I did my master's. I always did something else on the side. Um, so I was doing freelance copywriting um, whilst I was doing my PhD and also some uh, writing for a platform called Londonist, um, doing theatre reviews. And I also founded um, Society, which I believe is still running with my friend Steph um, at the university, which was um, really beneficial for my job that I then got. Um, and I didn't actually wait till I finished my PhD to get a full time job. I got it in the last six months of my PhD because I felt that at that point I could just finish it in the evenings. So I got a job at SOAS just next door um, in their marketing team where I worked um, for a year and a half. 
Um, and then last note, autumn 2021, I got the job that I'm now doing, which is for a law firm, um, which is as a content and communications manager. Um, and they were really interested in not only my writing skills from my PhD, from my job at SOAS, um, but my research skills, being able to take a lot of information, for example, in the archives, work out what was useful, um, form arguments, um, come up with kind of strategic aims. Um, and yeah, that's what I'm doing now. Fan fantastic. And also thanks to the audience. There's a great range of questions coming into the chat box. Now, some of the you are sending them directly to me, which is fine because I can read them and feed them back. But I also think if you can, if you put your questions in the everyone chat box, that encourages other people. So, so far we've got questions about you know, the sort of crisis of narrative. We've got questions about challenges um you know support networks we've got questions about reward and pay and the just last one that's come in from imran great question on about marketing your phd as work experience rather than study so keep those questions um coming in as we hear from our final speaker um kian warfield so if you can un unmute and sort of finish us off Hello, everyone. Yes, so great to be here. Um, and thanks to Liz and Naomi for inviting me along to this panel. Hello from Ireland. So I work in the Irish Civil Service. Um, I'm currently working in the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth. Um, and I work as a junior manager here in the Records Management Unit. Um, I completed my PhD in January 2020. I was at University College Cork. So it's actually kind of interesting to kind of uh, follow all of the other panelists because uh, I can kind of see a lot of parallels, um, especially with the likes of Ellie. And um, so I completed just before the first lockdown um, here in Ireland. Um, and for me, I did my PhD in Indigenous rights um, in Latin America. I was looking at Mexico and Bolivia specifically and uh, territorial rights issues um, in, in those uh, two regions. And that followed on from a research master's I did um, from 2014 to 2015 at the same university. Um, so once I had uh, submitted my thesis in 2020, I had 15 months before I managed to secure my first job. So it was quite a challenging um, time for me. Um, I suppose from that time, I suppose the best piece of advice I could probably give to those listening is I went about applying for every job that I thought possible in terms of what I could do. Um, I knew very early on that I didn't really want to work in academia. Um, a big part of my reason for that was the precarious nature of the work, which was also referenced by one of the panelists. Um, but it also felt very much like the PhD was never going to be enough. Um, I didn't really have publications. I didn't really have any of the other elements that are kind of required to sort of secure those good positions. So I decided that the public service here would be a much better option for me. I'd always been interested in politics, international relations. Journalism had crossed my mind as well. But again, the precarious nature of that work was just not going to suit me. I like stability and the public service offered that. Um, I suppose my ultimate goal is to pursue a career in diplomacy for the uh, uh, in the Department of Foreign Affairs here. In the Irish Civil Service, you certainly have to play the long game. So for the 15 months that I was trying to search for work, I tried to apply for civil service, or sorry, uh, civil society jobs, jobs in Brussels. And every time that I was applying and didn't get through, I kind of took a step back, reassessed why. I always constantly reviewed my CV. Um, I spent a lot of time building up my network. So I knew I wanted to work in diplomacy. I knew I wanted to work in international relations. So I spent a considerable amount of time on LinkedIn, building up networks, literally directly messaging diplomats um, on LinkedIn saying, I want to work in the Department of Foreign Affairs. Can you help me? I swear out of about a hundred odd messages that I sent, one got back to me, but that one person who currently serves in Saudi Arabia, that person, um, managed to help me hone my CV 
um, honed my application skills that landed me a position as a political intern in the Department of Foreign Affairs. So 15 months later, after I submitted my thesis, I landed a position in the Department of Foreign Affairs as an intern. Um, Throughout the time I was applying for work, I had applied for other civil service posts. They do an awful lot of graduate entry roles, but often you don't hear anything back for quite a while. So while I was working in the, Depart or in the Department of Foreign Affairs um, in their human rights unit, which was quite apt actually, because they did a lot of work on human rights issues. It was about embedding human rights policy across the department. Um, and I managed to actually apply some of my knowledge of indigenous rights, working on EU statements and things like that as well. So it was quite interesting from a policy perspective to see it in practice, to take the kind of theoretical knowledge that you had and apply it in kind of a real world environment. Um, but I'd also applied for other graduate posts in the civil service. And eventually I managed to secure the current role that I'm in two years later after I had originally applied. And I'm currently working in the records management unit. Um, which is very much about developing a records management policy for what is a, a, an ever-expanding department here. So the department is kind of famed in Ireland for managing the Ukraine crisis at the moment, but it has an awful, it has a very broad remit. Um, but I'm working kind of more internally within the operations side of the department. We're developing records management policy. And I used to think there was no correlation between my PhD and uh, uh, what I'm doing now, but there is because the PhD is such a monolith that you do end up developing such a wide range of skills. Like I was engaged in records management during my PhD because you have to manage a vast amount of resources. So I actually understood um, uh, to some extent the importance of managing records. So the most important thing and the best piece of advice I can do is deconstruct your PhD as you're trying to apply for work, kind of break it down. And the other panelists I think referenced this where they said, that they had kind of accumulated other experiences while they were doing it. You have to kind of sit back and deconstruct it and kind of view it from a variety of different kind of work experiences that you've done to actually get to where you are as, uh, uh, in terms of submission. Um, so that's kind of the approach that I took. I'm happy to take any questions on that as we go forward. So I'll leave it there for the moment. Thanks, Liz. Well, thank you so much, Kian. And that's a, a really good pulling together of some of the themes we've had, as well as a foreshadowing of the session at four o'clock when we're going to be talking about developing your transferable skills. And I'm definitely going to be referencing about the, the, the phrase, the PhD is such a monolith, you develop a whole range of skills, because that will be the, the theme of our session with myself and Antimo and, and Mona, students from IELTS. Um, to we'll be look we'll be um, looking at that. However, I've been looking at a really lively chat box. Thank you. Now, some of those questions I think you know we can probably address better in the later session. And what I want to do with the half hour that we've got left is to make the most of our panelists' sort of human experience. So, what I'm going to do is go back to our first question about I mean that lovely phrase. You know, thank you all for the for you know bringing your positive experiences but also being very authentic and honest about the challenges and i'm picking up from the chat box that people actually would love your take on some of the hard stuff that you have to to, to go through to progress your career thing so if i can start with lisa maria if you wouldn't mind starting us on the 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 question about a crisis of narrative i saw you respond to it very quickly so i'm hoping you might have your your view on that i would say to the other panelists what i'm going to do with the questions is i'll sort of summarize them and then invite you to on the reaction button put your hand up if you particularly think oh yes i've got something to say we haven't got time for all six of you to comment on all questions i will direct them but also, if you think, yes, actually, I'd like to chip on that, then put your hand up and I'll call you in. So, Lisa, Maria, would you start us off on crisis of narrative? Um, thank you so much for this question. I think it's really important. And I see scholars, for example, at academic sharing their um their unpublished papers or their rejection letters and so on online um, more and more. And I think that's that's super important. I'd say that in in my story, I think. Um, I, I avoided that step because I very early for myself took that decision that I didn't want to jump um, through the hoops of 150 applications um, to various universities for lectureships, um, et cetera, and, and various um, postdocs in, in different cities, different different countries. So that's why 
Um, that was part of my decision making process together with um, that desire to work on something more applied. And I was simply very lucky to um, have found the job opportunity when it presented itself and um, that I got it straight out of um, of my postdoc. Um, so that's that's my, my experience um, in that way it would simply be to continue to look for um, four options and not be not be afraid to apply for things that are a bit out there, but also um, I think as someone said it in a chat as well, maybe universities aren't, I was very lucky to be at the University of Cambridge that actually has got an amazing career support. Um, and I went there and got some advice in terms of what to do with my skills um, other than staying in academia. And um, also listen, I was lucky enough to have some mentors also who understood that I didn't want to go down the, the academic route um, at the time. So that's really important as well to find that support. Super. Thank you for starting us off on that. And I think that leads very nicely to the topic about support network and how having those conversations with other people, whether it's career services or academics or others. So can I invite um, other members of the panel, if you'd like to share something about the support network that's helped you navigate the other ups and downs of professional development after the PhD? Anyone want to kick off on that one? I might jump in there actually. Thank if that's you. Okay, Liz. Lovely. Um, yeah. So as I said, like I was 15 months looking for work. So I, I, you know, I'm entirely grateful to my parents to allow me to kind of stay in the house and try and find work, you know, and it's, it is that sort of practical thing that you do kind of need those sort of supports in place because that was, it was an awful period, you know, because you dedicate your heart and soul to this thesis Um you kind of almost lose yourself in it to the point where you're not quite sure almost who you are. And I'm still kind of in that post PhDs, post PhD kind of figuring kind of my life out all over again. You kind of have to start anew a little bit, especially when you're kind of leaving academia. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's been, you know, and, and, and as I said as well, like it, it isn't just about build, you know, a, a kind of a family and friends network and people who kind of understand the kind of struggle that it takes to kind of make that jump from you know academia into um into the kind of <laughs> the real world um but uh you know you do need to kind of go out there and sort of build a network in the sort of industry that you're kind of interested in pursuing and you know i was grateful for the the time that people have given me you know ambassadors um people who are currently serving in the department of foreign affairs people who are serving in the public sector who kind of provided that advice and guidance to me, which really helped me kind of hone the skill set because you're kind of looking at all of these transferable skills that you've kind of developed um, through the PhD. And you're kind of thinking how, what, like, where does any of this fit for this particular job? And you're kind of putting all of these little pieces together to try and pull together a CV that kind of makes you look like a credible candidate for this role. Um, because it, as I said, you know, the PhD is a monolith and, you know, you're, you've developed a whole host of skills. In some cases, you're not even sure that you've developed them, but you have, you know, like it, it's only when I was preparing for this panel that I realized that I do actually have records management experience. Whereas before I would have said, no, I don't, I know nothing about it, but it's not true. I do, you know, I did manage records, you know? Um, so, yeah, so I hope that kind of um, provides a bit of insight there. That's, that's really great. And Ellie, if I could bring you in, um, I had a question that came directly to me that flagged you, it, which talking about that support network. And also I'm aware that you're doing something that many of my PhD students talk to me about, about combining both your job, but also I think you, you know, nurturing that research and writing side of you, that portfolio. Could you tell a us a little bit about, you know, how the, the how you um, have navigated the challenges of that combination? Um, yeah, it's definitely not been um, straightforward. I think the first question that referred to like the crisis of personal narratives struck a chord with me, definitely. Um, yeah, I remember when I started my job, previous job at DTA, um, the first year or so was really, really hard because I, as I mentioned, I went into my PhD straight out of my undergraduate degree and my master's. Um, so yeah, by the time I started that job, I was maybe 28, 
29, but the only like adult version of myself who I had ever known was uh, an academic <laughs> person. And I suddenly, I didn't have that to rely on anymore. Like it definitely, as I said, like the skills I got from my PhD were really helpful in that role. And the fact that I had like a doctor in my email signature that definitely had weight, but ultimately like I wasn't seen in that way. And that was, that was really hard. It was, yeah, I guess a blow to my ego, definitely. Um, but I would also say in terms of like how I've navigated that, the fact that I was working a job where I was able to finish at five o'clock every day and spend time dedicating like a life and dedicating uh, a sense of myself outside of the academic system was also so, so liberating. Um, and I feel like in a lot of ways, like I've, uh, yeah, I've had space to like grow up in, in a way that I wouldn't have been able to grow up if I had just stayed within um, like academic work. And I think it's kind of because of this that I now feel um, quite resilient in, you know, quitting my job last autumn to try to uh, develop like the book from my, from my thesis and to, you know, do other postdoc work. I think that that has definitely come from a place of like um, feeling more, uh, yeah, feeling like a better knowledge, having better knowledge of, of myself and of what kind of motivates me. And also being aware that like, uh, yeah, I, I feel like I'm kind of doing this work now, not because it's going to be part of an academic career, but just because it's what, it's what I want to do. Um, and yeah, uh, sorry, I don't know. That was sort of waffly, but maybe there was some sense. Maybe there was a narrative somewhere. I else. think one one of the comments we're seeing the the chat box is how much the audience to be sure how authentic you are being. And I want so thank you, know, thank you um, to Lisa Maria and Ellie and and Kian to help us, you know, lead it, lean into some of the challenges and some of the the hard stuff. Um, often, particularly when you're pivoting, it's not straightforward. And looking at some of the questions, just to reassure some of the questions, things about how to market your CV to non-academic employers, um, how to find out about jobs. We're going to be covering that in the four o'clock session. But I want to, with our last 15 minutes or so, I want to just pivot a little, and I'm going to ask Sana in a minute uh, to, to, to go next. Um, you know, the, first of all, do feel free to add your encouragement to how you've navigated the challenges. This is this is an authentic and real space. But also, um, I'd like to start to take the pivot to look at things forward. So I think it was Ellie earlier, you used a, a phrase about how the PhD can, can accelerate your progression. And so, you, you know, you all have careers in front of you. So I'd like to know a little bit more about the, the joys of what you're doing now, but also how you'd like to see your future develop. So, Sana, can you help? Can you be my pivot speaker? Thanks. Yeah, um, it's really interesting, like hearing everyone speak and the kind of like overlaps and similarities and like experiences and like the feelings. Um, I think like for me personally, I, I don't know if I'm going to directly answer your question or maybe pivot a bit too much. But um, I think like what I like to think of like as my work at Wasa Theory is this sort of like academic academic adjacent kind of space so like Wasafiri is published by Routledge um we publish creative and critical writing um so we're publishing academic writing and creative writing but like alongside each other um and like I find that like like really like I find that it's like a really lovely like sweet spot for me personally because um having had the experience and like the kind of I guess like the weight of the PhD behind me but not wanting to necessarily like others here like work in academia per se and then kind of taking my like experience as like a freelance writer and like someone who's interested in journalism and curation and things like that and kind of like mix those two things um in a way that's exciting um and I think just kind of speaking back to like opportunities and like, you know, insisting that like doing something alongside the PhD, I think for me as well was really, really helpful um, to kind of realize that what it is that I didn't want to do as much as what where I kind of wanted to go. Um, so, you know, in terms of just sort of support networks and things like that, like with, with me, like um, 
the Chase um, editorial placement that I did that got me to the internship at WASFE was like, um, I was really lucky to be able to do that. And that is something that's offered to um, students across Chase um, universities. Um, so I think there are a lot of really interesting kind of like part time and I to, to emphasize I did all of these things part time um, at, alongside the PhD. Um, but there are these various kind of like the less obvious sort of like routes that you can kind of take to kind of figure out like whether it is like where, where you're interested in going. And I think that for me is like really exciting about sort of where I am now and doesn't speak too much to the future. I'm not sure I'm quite new in this in this role at was free, but have that experience of kind of doing these little things alongside my PhD um, um, and since for a while now. Yeah. Super, super, super stuff. And, and reinforcing a message we've heard from a number of you about the value of doing um, these um, enrichment activities. And some number of you will be with doctoral training partnerships. I used to work with Techni where they talked about enhancement activities. A number of you have referenced how useful it was to have you know, this sort of micro side hustle to allow you to not only to try things out, but also to, to build credibility. And I can see both Pardad and, and Lisa nodding. I'd also like to thank Lisa for her very useful comment in the chat box to say, given how many speakers we've got and how many good questions we've got, you know, do you feel um, free to put, to put in extra points into the chat box? Um, now, I've seen you nodding a couple of times, Pardad. So building on what Sana's been talking, can I ask you to do to 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 share some of of your sort of advice for challenges as well as you know the sort of excitement, but particularly somebody's put in the chat box a, a, a question about supervision, and you mentioned I think that you you were involved in that. So you know, do talk a little bit about that if you can. Yeah, no, this is, and I'm just thinking how much this this kind of event would have been useful to me a few years, a few years ago. Um, this is really great. This is happening. Um, and just building on what Sana said, um, I think the most useful thing that I did in my experience was was actually, I mean, I was lucky to be given the opportunity to do things beyond the academic side um, from the off. Um, but I also took three months out in the middle of my PhD to do a, a, an internship um, based on um, policy. Um, that was also within a British library, but in a completely different department, um, gave me the opportunity to, to learn a completely different set of skills um, to actually produce um, something that made an impact to the organization as well. Um, and I think, I think there's a bit of a, maybe an anxiety about stepping away from your PhD, um, midway, um, as well as an anxiety, an anxiety from stepping too far away from your research at the end of the thing as well. Um, and I think from the stories you've heard, it, it feels like we need to sort of be kinder to ourselves and give ourselves a bit of space and time to actually understand what it is we're, we're interested in. You can get, we can get quite, um, um, I guess, trapped in the, the niches we've created for ourselves in, in, our, in our academic area, not realizing the breadth of the work we've done and the potential impact of that work. Um, what was useful about doing these experiences within the PhD was you kind of, you, you, you're gradually building up a vocational profile um, and you could I could see how that would impact my, my PhD work along the way and, and you're kind of cumulatively creating a, um, um, a slightly more diversified um, uh, profile for yourself. Um, I actually, like Angarad, did um, move into the job two and a half years into my PhD, so I had to still manage the PhD alongside. Um, but I don't want to. I don't want to speak too long because I feel like I was maybe one of the lucky ones who was given the opportunity to to maybe not have the same challenges um, in in that in that uh, you know precarious in between. Um, so I'll, I might leave it there. I've got some other things to say, maybe to, to some other issues, but I'll, I'll open the floor again. Thank you, Pardad. And perhaps Angered, first of all, thank you very much. A really excellent post in the chat box. But you know, would you like to expand on that? Um, orally um yeah so i think i mean i was never one of those people who'd spend like nine until eight in the library like i i like to set myself very specific targets like today i'm going to you know read 
these two chapters and make notes on whatever. And then I'm going to be finished for the day. And then, do you know what I mean? Not just dragging it out. And actually, I think getting a job, I felt like I could let this end of my PhD drag on for months, but I needed some kind of push. I think it got to that point. I've been doing it for three and a half years and I just, you kind of get to that point. You're like, well, I don't really know what I'm doing anymore. And I just kind of want to be finished with this to feel like I've achieved it. And so actually getting a job really meant that I had to find time and be really specific with what I wanted to achieve in, in a specific time period. And it actually made me more productive um, in a funny sort of way. And I was very lucky that I could, I could schedule my supervisions for my lunch breaks at work. So it wasn't awkward. I didn't have to kind of leave work. Um, sorry, is my internet still there? Okay, good. I just wrote on my screen. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it, it won't work for everyone, but I, it really worked for me. Um, yeah. Fa fantastic. Um, and, and again, I think what we, what's great about having six different people is that you have all got different pathways and you've gone in different routes. But I think, you know, you can see the, the themes. And also I'd like to thank this really rich comment coming into the chat box, not only great questions, but also thank you to all the students who are sharing their experiences and their recommendations. And also a shout out for my careers consultant colleague, Holly Prescott, who writes a brilliant blog on PhD careers and she's just put an excellent um, link into the chat box so one of the things I hope you as an audience you're getting is you know a, sh a shared journey with undoubted challenges but also the fact just as Charles Burnett said at the beginning how much you know interesting work um, there is out there and how much the skills that you're developing through your PhD to Kian's point as I'm going to quit I'm going to be quoting for the rest of the year the PhD is a monolith you develop huge range of skills and that there are many different pathways and I think we've got about 160 students in the room and that means we're going to have 160 different pathways so we've now got 10 minutes so I want to give the panelists their final opportunity for their words but you get bonus points if you mention one of two words, which has come up in the chat box. So people have also asked if people might be prepared to say anything about pay or money. And also someone's raised that question you hear regularly about the PhD being seen as an overqualification and how, you know, the, how you present um, that. Um, and so, so uh, you know, if you can speak to those things, I know it'd be appreciated, but just take a moment and, you know, we'll, I'll start um, again, I'll start with you, Lisa, Lisa Maria, sorry, um, to start off. Um, and then I'll go around you quickly. And then, you know, we'll, we'll finish um, with a little a shout out for Wasafiri and the opportunities it's got. So Lisa Maria, could you start us off? Absolutely. So in terms of pay and money, um, I can say that I was my first. Um, so with my my postdocs, I pretty much was at the level of income that I would have had had I stayed in teaching um, at the time. So um, without without the PhD and um, and that has progressed since in, in a way that that one can hope for and 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 expect. Um, so that's that hopefully answers the question. And um, then I think I'd also I also wanted to um, uh, to comment on uh, build on what um, Angarad was talking about in terms of having really specific and precise goals. I couldn't agree more. So I always um, I always try to bear in mind that I wanted to produce in my PhD, the best piece of work I could produce in the assigned time frame, but also keep it realistic and keep in mind that it was never going to be my life's work in a way, um, and that I was always going to progress and develop my skills afterwards. Um, I think that's important because otherwise it can just get so endless and you can easily lose yourself. So that was that, that was something that worked for me, trying to um, stay within that time frame, giving that time to myself, but really dedicating myself to it um, during that time. Um, and there was, an, apart from pay, there was another part to your question, Liz, sorry. 
So if you had any experience where you felt that the PhD has been overqualification and that that has been something that you've had to sort of tiptoe around? No, so not in my case, given that I had those postdoctoral experiences and then also uh, my current role, um, actually, it was a desired qualification um, to have a PhD in in my current role. And now um, it's actually a required qualification as head of research. So that wasn't the case for me. Thank you. Ellie, can I ask you to go next? Uh, Yes. Um, Yeah, pay pay and money. Um, that's I th- yeah I think it's a really important thing to talk about I think as I mentioned in my um my introduction I had this situation in the first year of work where I'd started off as an administrator and then I both came to realize and like my, my boss ultimately also came to realize that I was doing like a lot more than what I was getting paid to do um and I had to to ask quite insistently <laughs> uh, to get that recognized on my job description. And that was really hard. Um, and it, yeah, it was definitely kind of difficult to, to have to do that. But I think, yeah, that, that's kind of like what you have to do in the workplace a lot of the time. Um, and yeah, I was lucky in that it worked for me. But yeah, there is definitely kind of an issue with um the fact that you are yeah bringing like really really valuable skills to employers and you they will not be like recognized immediately necessarily um in the way that you maybe think that they should be um what was the other element of the question so some uh, yeah I'm conscious of, of time so i think if if i may i'll move i'll move on to sana um, um, Sana, have you had any experience of feeling that your PhD was an overqualification? Um, not, no, uh, is the short answer. I, I think I'm still trying to figure it out to an extent because I've only kind of had this period, like I only started putting doctor into my signature about like eight months ago. So it feels very new. Um, it was something my our editor was very insisted I do and I found that quite interesting um so I'm still trying to kind of grapple with that but just to speak to the pay aspect um and kind of offer something um yeah for example was is a registered charity where arts council funded by the arts council so it really kind of speak I work part-time um at three and a half days a week um it really speaks to the kind of like general like precarity of the arts in the UK at the moment as well where we're having these conversations around kind of pay and salary and people who are like I've always kind of done multiple things at the same time uh, so I think it's okay but for those who kind of like are looking for a more kind of stable job even outside of academia like there are organizations that are like doing amazing work but are kind of chronically like underfunded so that is a very like kind of real um, thing to talk about as much as we kind of also talk about like how amazing these various organizations are and like the kind of work they're trying to do. Yeah, thanks. And in terms of an um, amazing organisation, my colleague Naomi is going to put into the chat box an amazing opportunity from Wasafiri. Um, the thank you, beautifully timed. So, um, and again, picking up on that that trend of you know doing extra things, enrichment activities while you're doing your PhD. Maybe this is your enrichment activity. And Garrett, is there anything final points to, that you'd like to to add to our discussion as we close off? Um, I guess on the pay topic, um, so when I, I did apply for a couple of postdocs when, before I decided, I thought I'd, I'd get a job whilst I finished my PhD, see how it went, and then, you know, apply for some postdocs and maybe move into that direction. And I applied for a couple and I didn't get anywhere, but actually even the ones I applied for, the pay wasn't very good. Um, and it would mean kind of moving, which wasn't something I was prepared to do. Um, the job I got, which was for a university, was fairly well paid for a London, I think it was about 30 grand um, for a London wage. Um, and But then moving into the private sector where I am now, is obviously you get paid a bit more. Um, and actually on overqualification, I think my PhD is one of the reasons I got my current job. And they were really, really interested in it. Um, some of the other interviews I had for other companies, they kind of, you know, it, it was a nice to have, but it, it wasn't really, it wasn't a make or break, but actually the role that I'm in, I think it, it did kind of tip me over the edge. 
thank you. you um, thank you. And also, I think, thank you for you very much for your honesty. I mean, William's put in the chat box, you know, money's a taboo. It's important that we talk about it. And those trade-offs between types of um, organisations and what they offer are part of things you have to navigate post-PhD. So, Pardad, any final words from you? Um, I think just on the overqualification question, I... <clears throat> I think a PhD is always a very impressive and desirable uh, qualification to hold. But I think going back to the the, um, the conversation around um, diversifying um, and actually thinking widely and generously about what it is you have done um, and how to frame that, uh, I wouldn't be afraid of maybe sort of skilling up some of those things as you as you look to transition. Uh, think about you know if, for example, that. You have a very niche literary subject, but you also, you know, in your um, lit review or um, in your research methodology, you are also a, um, you know, as, as Kian said, a records manager, an archivist, or someone who's dealt with ethics, or someone who's dealt with intellectual property. You know, you, you in some way you will have a a more universal um, niche, uh, which you can, you know, hundred percent both sell, but also but also skill up. And I think let's rather than thinking about a you know a thesis, um, the academic side of a PhD as an overqualification, it's a desirable um, and very much a complementary um, uh, achievement um, to think of in, in in you know in parallel with with a lot of other things that you you know could could very much um, frame for the, for the for the jobs you're applying for. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. And I want to give Kian the, the last minute, if I may, to pick out sort of you may one sentence to send us all into the break, encouraged in, in, in the post career PhD career path. And a lot of pressure. Uh, <laughs> no, just to say, I suppose, um, in terms of uh, overqualification. I certainly felt in my political internship I was somewhat overqualified, but there's a lot to be said that you know the PhD isn't the end of our learning journey, and um, there is a lot of learning still to be done. I don't know if I can be heard. Can I? Yeah. yeah there's yeah. still an awful lot of journey. There's still an awful lot of learning to be done. You know, and having doctor in front of your name kind of demonstrates that. Like there's, you know, I have a I have a 40 year career ahead of me in the public service. You know, and they really do reward that kind of ambition and learning. And we'll fund that, you know, so it says a lot about you, I think, and your character and your willingness to kind of buckle up and learn and, and kind of do all of that. Um, so, you know, it's, it, you know, it, it, it's definitely a worthwhile qualification and people shouldn't feel disheartened if maybe you, you jump into a, a career or a job that may not necessarily be directly related to it you know, you'll find opportunities for learning. I think we're all here on the call as PhDs. We do love to learn, you know, so just to kind of note that as well, I think I hope that's a sort of optimistic tone to kind of end on. <laughs> I couldn't have asked for better, Kian. So I would like to find our six doctors. I'd like the chat box to light up with emojis, emotions, thanks. It's been such a rich hour. We've covered so much. You've been so honest and authentic. I hope that everybody in the in the room feels that you know that the 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 part you know part of um, this tribe of you know PhD learners wear it with pride and with thanks for us all. Um, I'd like to now send us into the break. Um, we are back. Our keynote speaker is at twenty five to four, so that's fifteen thirty five. So we'll see you back in 20 minutes. And my warmest thanks again to our speaker panel. You've been fabulous. Thank you so much. So it is my real pleasure to introduce Dr. Kate Daubney. She's director of the Careers Group, but she also has a PhD in the humanities and has her own experience as an academic, a researcher and a writer, as well as a long-standing interest and expertise in the career paths of doctoral students. So with that introduction, I'd like to invite Kate to take us from grave to cradle, unpacking the value of doctoral studies. Over to you, Kate. Thank you so much, Liz. It's a real genuine pleasure to be able to join everyone today. Fantastic audience, so inspiring. Um, and this is an exploration, isn't it? And also I think a celebration 
of the richness of opportunity that students and graduates of language based studies, which is, of course, exemplified by the Institute of Languages, Cultures and Societies, can actually realise and go on to realise after their research um, in their working lives and their careers. And indeed, um, I want to stress the importance of recognising that you're all already living a plural of narratives. Because what we heard today from our inspiring panellists is that every single role that you hold embodies a multiple of narratives of skills and experience of your personal values and your goals. And it was so enjoyable to me to hear the journeys and stories of all the colleagues on the alumni panel and to be reminded, I think, of the role that happenstance and also an opportunity facing mindset can play in opening up often quite unexpected roles and professional experiences that build on all those existing successes and the achievements and experiences of doing the PhD. But I think behind happenstance and such an opportunity facing mindset can also lie a more intentional understanding of ourselves and what as fundamentally interdisciplinary researchers of the humanities and particularly the cross section through the languages, cultures and societies that you're exploring, that you're bringing from your complex academic journeys into the workplace, whatever that workplace looks like. So today I'd like to explore what such an intentional understanding might look like and to reflect a little bit on the future of work and how well placed I see graduates of the subject areas that you inhabit as being to enter that future. So you might be wondering who is this woman and what does she know about my future? And I think that's a really good question. So as, as Liz says, my official job title is Director of the Careers Group, which is the Federation of Career Services of many of the University of London's federal members. And I've been working in careers education for about 20 years. But actually, I began my professional career as an academic. It was like hearing all those past versions of myself during the panel. Um, and I spent seven years as a film musicologist, who is someone who unpicks meaning from musical language as captured in film scores and the audience experience of film scores. And I taught and researched first at the University of Derby and then at the University of Leeds. And having published my first book and my peer reviewed journal article, I then realized that I had fallen entirely out of love with my subject. And then I spent quite an awkward few years wrestling with, I suppose, an intellectual challenge of having apparently prepared for only one career, the academy. And I didn't have that self-awareness that some of our panelists had today. Um, and I found myself in kind of... Um, difficult but important innate personal understanding that the academy was not the career for me. And by happenstance, I found myself working with people who were just like me, whose personal circumstances who had changed, who sort of discovered new things about themselves, some of which were quite difficult, and were looking for new ways to understand what they offered to the job market. And just a few years after that experience and, and leaving academy altogether, I went to work, in fact, at the London School of Economics. I kind of went round the back and came in the other door because I was supporting PhD and postdoc researchers to explore their career choices in, around and beyond the academy. So I've occupied some of the professional spaces that everybody on this call today has occupied. And I've also been really fortunate and privileged to make a career out of helping people find and navigate all those multiple professional spaces. I've also, rather ironically, more recently had the privilege of developing a completely new second research career on the relationship between employability and curriculum, which has actually, as a sort of personal journey, restored my faith in my own relationship with research and also diversified my understanding of my own career paths. I really loved working at the LSE. I had a really extraordinary joy, to be honest, of peering over the shoulders of researchers who were trying to solve some of the biggest problems that the world faces. So things like food and water security, reducing poverty, embedding effective development and aid support, stabilizing governments and ensuring social justice. So big, big questions. And I have a very equitable attitude to research. No one discipline is ever more important than another. But watching these students, there was a kind of eating the elephant aspect, as there often is to social sciences research. You know, where do you even start with these enormous problems? And I think for me, that meant it was actually a very humbling experience to be the PhD careers advisor. Here were some incredibly diverse individuals of all ages and backgrounds and identities who were inspired and confident in their research. And yet they were also coming to me and saying, what should I do with my life after this particular research journey is over? What's out there for me? And I think it was humbling because firstly, it reminded me that everyone's relationship with their research is different. 
what brings us to our topic? What guides us through our process and our first substantial pieces of authorship? And how do we understand and view the doors that do open or don't open for us during and after that research journey? Because I'd fallen out of love with my research. I thought for a really long time that I was the only person who'd ever done that. And then when I went to the London School of Economics, I not only realized that this was true for other researchers too, who were working on far more significant and important topics than 1930s film music, um, but that also falling out of love with my research topic didn't mean the end of my relationship with research, either with the experience that had gone before or my sense of what was important um, about research to me. And I think that came across really nicely in some of the panelists' comments this afternoon. I think secondly, working at the LSE was really humbling because I'd gained the responsibility and the opportunity to help these researchers find a new way to understand themselves and what they offered. And I think the prevalent narratives in much of education can reflect often quite a linear relationship between the subject that we, that we study, we, we might call that knowledge, and the workplace outcome that knowledge is seen to lead to. And I think this no, notion of, of linearity, it starts at school, and it continues throughout further and higher education, and I have to say not particularly helped by rather simplistic government and regulatory narratives. And so somehow that linearity seems to pull us in more and more tightly as we progress through the stages of postgraduate education. And in research terms, I think it can feel inconceivably difficult to leave behind that long-term investment in sort of pinhead of specialism that we've developed, which has also, I think, become very strongly embedded in our sense of identity and self. And I think it's one thing to say, I've fallen out of love with my research and I want to go and do something else now. And it's quite another to say, I absolutely adore my research, but I'm worried that there won't be anywhere in academia for me to enter and continue my work. At the LSE from 2008 to 2010, which is when I was there, I saw the very start of the contraction in the academic jobs market. And here we are 15 years later, and we're still seeing it continue to worsen. And I think within the University of London, we're incredibly fortunate that we have Liz Wilkinson and Edwin Marr, who are two University of London careers consultants working at, right across the School of Advanced Study, who are really well placed to support our students here individually to navigate the personal and contextual uncertainty that comes with that. And in fact, many career services in universities now will have a careers consultant who is a specialist in working with PhDs. So do seek them out. So to complement that kind of looking back in my own life, I'd, I'd like to identify three lenses, which I think we can understand and use to understand our relationship as interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary researchers when we think about non-academic workplaces and professional identities. Firstly, as a parallel or companion narrative to the specialism of your subject area, I'd like to propose that you are indeed highly developed in a range of transferable skills not just the skills of research and analysis, but the rich diversity of transferable skills that are innate to your disciplinary area. In the context of the talk curriculum, we actually very rarely discuss or even think about how diverse the transferable skills that are innately developed through different subject studies. And this is the area of my current research. So if we think about researchers focused on text, for example, which is true across many humanities subjects, we can recognize an array of cognitive skills that you're developing around things like contextualization, connection and comparison, or the development application and interpretation of perspectives, or the analysis of text through theories, methods, or techniques, and approaches to critical analysis that seek the development of a deep understanding of text or of experience of authorial intention. But in other disciplinary areas that you're also inhabiting, you might also be arguing or making decisions. You might be gathering and presenting evidence and doing that verbally and increasingly through diverse media forms and languages. You might be creating and curating. You might be using theories or models where language itself is concerned. You might be recognizing multiple nuances and how the same thing can be expressed in, by embedding context or embedding meaning and interpretation. And then on top of all of that, you're communicating yourselves because you're persuading and influencing, questioning and listening, constructing texts of your own and then deconstructing our own texts. You're building rapport and relationships with your readers and your listeners when you're a speaker and a writer. And by way of sort of mindsets and behaviors and values, you're also outward looking. You're incredibly curious and expressive, empathetic, passionate, reflective, 
you're not merely tolerant of ambiguity and uncertainty, but you're actually actively seeking it out and celebrating it. You're thinking independently and you're taking risks intellectually. You're perceiving holistically and you're engaging interculturally. And that's before we even consider your skills as a researcher and perhaps also as an educator. To hear those transferable skills that are innate to your discipline, listed, I think, in that way, can feel really overwhelming. And I think also it can be a bit of a wake-up call, I hope in a good way, to a really nuanced and actually quite sophisticated range of professional behaviours and competences that you're already performing all the time. And those assets, which is a difficult word to hear sometimes, but it's a good word, those assets that you have there make you incredibly employable, whatever you're choosing to do and whatever context you find yourself in. And we heard panellists today talk about how difficult it was to find that language. Go and find that language. It will really help you. My second lens builds on that by suggesting that it's not merely the richness of skills that you develop and use, which makes you so employable, but also in your particular case, your ability to move between different disciplinary perspectives. Public policy and international economic think tanks spend an enormous amount of time thinking about what the skills of the future need to be. But when we dig down into the suggestions that we get from these think tanks, what we consistently find is the fusion of different skill groups together. So the World Economic Forum, for example, in, in 2020 suggested, even before the pandemic changed our understanding of so much, that skills needs would fundamentally be complementary, that we would need combinations of fluid and unpredictable skills like creativity and originality and initiative, and we'd need those to complement the process and detail of things like critical thinking and analysis. They also suggested that we'd need active learning skills and those would complement technology use and things like emotional intelligence to complement things like systems analysis. And I think when we start thinking about really big global problems that we need to deal with as a society, their complexity starts to make us think not only about what work we will be doing, but also how we will be working. How will we be doing that work? Because the kind of global problems that we're thinking about now are cross-system, they're cross-functional, they're cross-sectoral and they're cross-disciplinary. And they're demanding of us that we move beyond conventional ways of thinking and working and solving problems. And given that your research areas innately require mindsets and skill sets that support cross-language, cross-cultural and cross-disciplinary connections, you're really well placed already, should you choose to work beyond the academy in particular, to be impactful in a world that has exactly the need that you meet. In the University of London Career Service, we've also got colleagues who are exploring transdisciplinary collaboration where students from different backgrounds and perspectives intentionally step up and beyond their disciplinary areas to create new ways of understanding and working. And I think you are in an incredibly strong position to work effectively in such an approach. And I'm confident that this is one of the approaches that already defines impactful workplaces of the now and not just of the future. And that question of how we work is going to be my third and final lens, because I think if we learned anything from the pandemic, it's that ways of working are more diverse and more fluid than ever before. Research and practice from the Future of Work Institute at the Curtin University in Perth, Australia, proposes that the future of work is most clearly navigated when we actively engage with uncertainty and with interconnectedness. Now, engaging positively with uncertainty may feel both inevitable and counterintuitive. We just want everything to just stop just for a minute. But in practice, it actually means actively embracing uncertainty rather than trying to reduce its impact. It means things like thinking differently about strategy and planning and running towards doing things differently and flexibly and being fundamentally adaptable and proactive. And I think just as with transdisciplinarity, that's going to involve being open to far more diverse perspectives. And I think there's a really important parallel with inclusion here, too, because we're going to do better at responding to uncertainty if we structurally embed far more diverse perspectives in how we respond to that uncertainty. And I think as linguists and as cross-cultural interdisciplinary researchers, you are also innately well-placed to engage positively with interconnectedness, actively seeking out other perspectives that enable collaboration. And when you engage positively with intentional complexity in the relationships you're exploring. So I want to finish by saying that I know that in some ways this is an exceptionally difficult time to be researchers and to inhabit an academy that has never been more complex and really more challenging. 
And I recognize very well the luxurious oasis of peace and joyful reward that diving into our research can offer us. And as one academic put it to me not that long ago, our students come here to escape the world and not to prepare for it. So I would leave you with the thought that even while you might escape the world through your research, you are also preparing yourself very effectively to be impactful and highly employable in whatever future you choose. I wish you very well with that journey, whatever shape your futures take. Thank you for listening. And thank you, Kate, for giving us that, that bigger picture of, of the journey of the interdisciplinary academic. Now, I'm conscious that Kate will undoubtedly have a four o'clock commitment. So I'm going to stop by thanking you, saying thank you very much. Do feel free now to move on to your next thing. We've got five minutes of buffer. So I'm going to take some time to chat to the, the chat box and just to pick up some of the comments. So first of all, I would like to thank those students who've been having conversations in the chat box, sharing ideas. This is a great place to actually connect with your fellow student community. Um, I thank you, William, for your comment that it's lovely that the University of London has opened this up nationally. I just want to take this opportunity to remind you that that is what the School of Advanced Study does. We're a centre of excellence in humanities. And for any of you for whom this is your first School of Advanced Study event or your first Institute of Languages, Cultures and Societies event, I do encourage you to look at the SAS events website, some of you um, I've met before when we do our research training program. So we often do things on things like the imposter syndrome and managing the momentum of your PhD, as well as more PhD technical skills. Much of our training is delivered online and very accessible to people, not only within the UK, but abroad, more broadly in Europe across the world. So do, do have a look at what SAS offers in terms of supporting humanities um, researchers. Thank you very much, Cathy. So, so, but also this is, you are all part of a disciplinary cohort and a researcher cohort. I loved what Kian said earlier. He said, we're, you know, we're researchers, we love learning. But also I think it can be isolating and we have been talking about that roller coaster and those challenges. So it's also important to have your community of support and practice. So this is also an appropriate place to share things like LinkedIn details, any publicly um, available social media ha um, handle, then the chat box is an appropriate place to network. And I know some of you will be um, sort of contacting each other through other channels. Um, so do you know, do continue those conversations um, off offline and take this opportunity. One of the things that we always hope when we put on events like this is not only do you go away inspired by our speakers, that you're being encouraged to take that time to reflect on the skills that you are developing and how you can put those across, create that narrative to pick up on Charles, Charles's words right at the beginning. Um, it's so much about creating a narrative, exploring your your options, but also that you do feel part of a community of endeavour. So thank you, thank you very much. And and um, Williams put his contact details in. Um, and you know, um, and again, you know, off many of you will be on Twitter or or LinkedIn, and those are handles you may want to share. Final session of the day and well done to all of you who've um, stayed through the whole of the afternoon to come to this session on how to develop and communicate your PhD transferable skills. You've met me already. I'm Liz Wilkinson. I'm the Senior Careers Consultant with the School of Advanced Study, but I'm particularly delighted to introduce two of our Institute of Language, Cultures and Society students, um, Antimo Lucarelli and Mona Habib. So welcome to you both, and we're going to be hearing from them later. And to some extent, this session is sort of address some of the questions that were coming into the chat box earlier. So I was just scrolling back through the questions that you were asking us earlier. And I think one of them crystallizes what this session is about, which is about, you know, how might I present my PhD to non-academic employers? Now, I did think Kian did a very good job of bringing out the skills you develop in your PhD. So we've lost, I think he's stolen some of our thunder, but one of the reasons we put this session at the end is we do hope you found this afternoon inspiring, but then, you know, you've got to take action. You've got to do something differently. You've got to 
tweak your narrative both inside your own head and to employers and this is the practical session where we hope to equip to do you you to do that so what we're going to do is we're going to explore why phd skills are needed more now than ever before um, look at the, the transferable skills look about how you can enhance and market your phd experience and also talking a little bit about boosting and building your network because i think and all of those themes i think were fo foreshadowed in some of the things that our phd alumni panel said earlier and one of the reasons um, that i want to leave you building on what kate has talked about about actually doing your phd it changes you for life you are forever going to look at the world slightly differently than you would have done if you had not done a PhD. And I think clearly when we're doing anything, what we want to know is what is our next step. But one day you're going to look back and say, well, I did my PhD. For many of you, you'll be able to say I did it 20 years ago. Even with those of you who are mature students, life expectancy is increasing. So you will look back and reflect on how the PhD made you the person that you are. And I think it is because of this combination of thoughtful discovery. I love Kate's points about the refuge one can find in one's research, that you can get lost in it. But also, it's a project manu management roller coaster. And some of that came across from some of what our speakers were saying. You will all know that a PhD is not plain sailing that you're pushing on original knowledge. So there will always be ups and downs. And the thing is that we live in what is often now described as a hyper-changeable world. Some of you will have come across the concept of VUCA, which I think originally came out of the American Pentagon and has been taken up quite a lot in organizational thinking, talking about environments that are volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous and we are these you know this is is not the first time the world's been a VUCA environment here's Charles Dickens talking about um, two cities London and Paris and talks about how you have these times of extremities um, it's often um, thought that we are in another age of extremes and in those environments that you need roller coaster riders. And one of the other um, periods, I mean, you can tell I'm a historian by background, so I often use historical metaphors to look at what's going on now, where have we seen this before? And actually, one of the ones I often reference, the last time that humanities was called to heroism and to take their research skills out to the public good, well, one of those very famous times is the code breaking at Bletchley Park, where many, many of the code breakers came from um, a language, cultures and societies background. And things. when you've got complex problems where, where nobody quite knows the way ahead, then often somebody with good humanities, research and analytical skills is what you need. But actually, you can say, well, that's all very inspirational, Liz. But, you know, we also were at this, this interface where there's this very stormy environment, but also there's lots of hierarchies um, and bounce, apparent boundaries. You know, I think the, the question that picked up earlier, and it was a really good question, I'll thank the person who asked it, about hope of qualifications. You know, people are seeing my PhD and discounting me. So, so you have these, these rigidities at the same time as this time of, of chaos. Um, and, and I think having worked with PhD students now for 20 years, the one of the things that I observed is that, that there is something about the academic research pro, um, process and the critical method, the, the testing things till destruction, that can sometimes make the individual feel a bit smaller. You, you stand as did Isaac Newton, and you look at the, the this huge scale of your subject. Kate talked about chopping down the elephant. It might make you feel a bit small. 
you know, you, you're always having your ideas tested because that is the academic method. So that may, may make you feel a bit sport, s- small. And sometimes academic discourse can quite be quite critical and sometimes a bit aggressive. That can make you feel small. Then we add to that the fact that we all inhabit, as Kate referenced, the choppy academic market and also this public discourse about, you know, what are the humanities worth? All of this can have a bit of a shrinking effect. And my my aim today is actually to, first of all, to make that conscious, but also to say, well, where's the way forward? And where do we find the way forward? Well, we saw six different pathways. um, And and actually, what I'm in my work with humanities PhD students, you find humanities and languages, cultures, and societies PhD students all over um, the job market. But what you find when people pivot is that they have to be more explicit about the skills, and skills are the language of the job market. And I think that's never been more true. I'm doing some work at the moment looking at applicant tracking systems and where people are using AI to pre-select CVs. And actually, you know, the way in which people leverage the skills language is part of the way it sorts. So I think I think it's all been true for some time and it's been sort of intensified as people are using AI more in those sorting processes. So one of the things, and I am talking to a room full of people with many linguistic and texture analysis skills, is we have to take control of the language and to Charles's point, create the narrative. And claim, and I think our alumni panel encourage us to do this, is to claim the skills and actually in our own heads first, and then we can convey it to others, see a PhD journey as a skill in Accelerator. So I'd like you in the chat box, this is, you know, is to look at these seven skills. Some of them we heard referenced earlier, some of them we didn't. And just type into the chat box and Mona and Antima, you're very welcome to do this as well. Just type into the chat box, thinking about your own PhD experience, which of these skills do you think have been most honed by that? Thank you very much to Alara, Amy, starting us off. Thank you. That's great. Uh, so lots of people are saying lighting skills. Mona's coming with project management. I just say, thank you, Sharon, all of them. Yes, I would say all of them. Uh, so, I mean, some of you will be more at the beginning of your PhD, but for those of you doing a third year, you know, a bit like Kean would say, oh, yes, record management. And I suddenly realized I'd done it already. And then I think, you know, to that question that somebody said, how do you present your PhD as work experience? Then just as we look at a sk- job and say, what skills did I develop? We look at the PhD and say, what skills did you develop? It? Great. Excellent. So now we're going to take this to the next level. So I'm joined today by two of my own PhD students. And we're going, what we're going to do is we're going to skill parse a, um, a language, cultures and societies PhD. And so Mona and Antwerp are both at the same institute, but having talked to them, actually their PhDs are quite contrasting and shows the real diversity of your discipline. So I'm hoping that by their two perspectives, that many of you will say, oh yes, that's that in methodologically or in theme, That is like my PhD. So they've kindly agreed to be interviewed live by me about their PhD. So I'm going to ask them questions about it. So that's what we're going to be doing on camera. Your role is to listen to our conversation and to spot the skills. Some of the ones we've mentioned, but you'll think of others. This is likely to be a very literate room. So, you know, feel free to come in with new words, invent words, mash up words. Um, Now, you know, when I, you know, and, and, you know, there are no wrong or right answers in the chat box. And the great thing about doing this in the chat box is that you can all be typing, typing at the time and getting a lot of energy. And then I'm going to give Mona and uh, Antimo an opportunity to read through what you said and to give their response at the end of the session. So what I'm going to do, because we're doing it with 
with two people, which is I'm going to do it in sort of two sections, um, asking them both similar, similar questions. Um, so you don't have to particularly distinguish between, oh, Antimo's shown that skill, Mona's shown that, just as you hear the skill put in. So we're, we're doing a, an aggregate, a composite. Okay, so Mona, can I ask you to, to unmute to start with? And if, if I can start by asking you to um, summarize your PhD for us. Yeah, sure. So um, my PhD analyzes Arab diaspora identity representations in contemporary film and literature. The material I work with is in French, English and Italian. I am looking at the French and Italian works in translation because I'm not a speaker of those languages myself, but I do speak um, Arabic. I'm a native speaker of Arabic, so I can understand the cultural um, hues that are available in those representations. Um, yeah, so looking at representations across three linguistic areas is what intrigued me the most, um, coming from an English literature background and being a native speaker of Arabic, I was always um, consciously and unconsciously reading English texts through different cultural lenses. So that's the inspiration to my research. And how do you go about it? Can you just talk me through your research process? Um, so I do look at contemporary films, so things that are produced by Netflix and Hulu um, that represent Arab communities in Anglophone areas or French speaking areas, Italian as well. I haven't found any Italian representations yet. So if you have any um, suggestions to put it in the in the in the box, chat box. But yes, I do look at these representations and I look at the literature that's available as well. And I kind of try to gauge an understanding of what Arab diaspora identity um, means to these writers or how they are being represented across the globe. Um, the most important part of this PhD is that it is it has a strong regional aspect. Arab society is across North Africa and the Middle East, but I am looking at representations that are mainly based in Europe and America. So essentially, it's a worldwide um, topic. Um, the way I approach it is textual analysis, film analysis, and some interviews with creators. And how do you go about organizing? your research um so i have with the help of my supervisor split my research split my research into um linguistic areas so i look at the italian material first and then the french and then the english and then in the end draw some conclusions on how our identity has been represented in the same or differently depending on these linguistic areas um, I do look at my um, corpus first and then look at some um, theory, some analysis that has been said before and, and draw my own conclusions. And with the support of some interviews, should I be able to conduct them? Um, that's kind of how I'm approaching my research at the moment. Super. So I'm going to ask you, that we'll come back to, to Mona, but I'd like to now switch over to Antimo. Um, and so Antimo, if you can um, un, unmute and uncloak. Sure. And, I'm going, and likewise, I'm going to ask you similar three questions. So if you can you know, summarise your research for us. Sure. So um, let me start from my title, just from the title of my research. The title is Death, after death and eternity uh, in the human being, starting from Ernst Bloch, Martin Heidegger, and Emanuele Severin. So the theme itself is to understand how the human being, how we all as human beings relate to these three very important belongings, as we may call them. That means death, after death, and eternity. Of course, I'm doing this starting from some uh, texts from these thinkers. The first two are German thinkers, so Martin Heidegger, uh, well-known, and Ernst Bloch, well-known as well. And the last one is an Italian thinker uh, of the 20th century. They've all been thinkers of the 20th century, so Emanuele Severi. That is overall the theme of my research. 
And you know, how do you go about it? Tell me a little bit more about your methodology and how you approach it. Sure. So, um, of course, one first um, element is the textual analysis, just as Mona said. Um, so I'm analyzing some texts from these thinkers, but then there is some kind of a more technical uh, methodology that is that may be called the phenomenological or the ontological one. I know that may seem, I don't know, a little bit too technical, but that means to try to detect the essential elements of these three uh, horizons. So death, after death, and eternity within uh, the human being. So that is, those are the main two methodologies. The first is uh, more formal. Uh, the second one is more linked to the discipline itself. Super. And then about how do you organise your research? And I was thinking more about the sort of, um, you know, your, your sort of your research week or your, your sort of research sort of plan of work. Sure. So, um, usual, so of course, um, I'm starting from the texts, as I said. So uh, first, there is a literature review of the texts. But then, uh, of course, um, I'm trying at least to elaborate, start from those texts, uh, my own perspective. So first of all, there is uh, text analysis and then, of course, writing. I try to uh, alternate these two uh, phases of the research. Super. Excellent. Right, I'm going to uh, switch back over to Mona now. So thank you, Andrew. We'll be back with you soon. So Mona, if I can ask you to unmute. So I'm doing. So I'm sort of moving out. I would just like to get a sense of what does your typical research day or week or month look like. Mm, it depends on where I'm at with my research. So I'm quite um, well versed on my corpus, so I know my films very well my material, like the main material that I will be analysing, I know it quite well. Um, so most of my research uh, lies in looking at uh, current theorizations of identity, diaspora, what is currently being said about the Arab community, reception to these um, productions. Um, a lot of it is, um, you know, just looking at journals and recent publications but i also spend a lot of time on social media seeing the reception of the contemporary works that i'm working with that helps me formulate formulate a lot of ideas in itself and that's one of the great things about working with contemporary material is that you can see um current views of people across the globe in multiple languages which i'm thankful that i'm able to read um so yeah, so I do I do read a lot um, of research, but I also write a lot because for me, if an idea comes to my head, I have to write it down immediately or else I will lose it by the end of the day. And I'm sure everyone um, has experienced this and knows what I'm talking about. Um, if I do not put that down on paper, on any paper, so I have these with me everywhere, um, it, I will lose it. And then using these cards, um, I then sit maybe in the evening and like develop this into a whole 2000 word paper, for example. And then from that, I maybe leave it for a week, come back to what I've written, these like bulk, you know, writing skills. And then I highlight the most important parts, things that are really intriguing, make sure that I haven't reiterated things that I've spoken about before. And then I compile it into material that can be, you know, passed to my supervisors. So yeah, that's my kind of um, format. But yeah. And how, how do you go, about, what, tell me a bit more about your meetings and communications with your supervisors and other academics. Yeah, so with my supervisors, if I do feel like I'm stuck in the rut um, sometimes with ideas, I do, you know, send them a quick email, see if they're free and just tell them explicitly, I've come across this material or I've come across this idea and I don't know, do I have room, say, in my thesis to include this? If I do include it, what are the um, pros and cons, for example? How would I go about it? Do I put it in the beginning? Do I put it in the end? 
Um, I'm very open with just asking them, asking them straightforward if I have any issues with my research. But um, I also ask them a lot about career advice. So if I do get opportunities, for example, to work with a charity or to work in cons consultancy, um, I probably run that by them as well. And they give me great advice on how to approach it in terms of pay in terms of um, making sure I manage my time effectively alongside the PhD. And it's, it's been great. Okay, and finally, and it's delighted to hear that's great. And the final question, and then Andrew, I'm going to ask you the same question, so you, which is, what do you find most challenging? Oh, what do I find most challenging? Um, I think time management is a serious one because, like I said, my work is regional, so there's a lot of things that I can do with this information that I've got um, and a lot of ways that I can you know, put it in different like career paths. But I have, I've had to learn how to say no <laughs> to some opportunities and to prioritize um, what I have at hand, which is my PhD. I do want to finish this in three to four years. This is a great project I am very passionate about, but I need to give myself the time and space to actually conti continue it and finish it um, more concisely. Being concise is very difficult as well because I, I work with such amazing material and a lot of ideas spring out randomly throughout the week, but I need to be very reasonable with myself and which ideas I can put in and which might be better off in like a per publication maybe, not in my thesis. So those have been two very challenging parts. Um, Otherwise, I think everything I've been able to tackle by being open with my supervisors and just asking them questions, and they probably have the answer. And you know, I'll, cut, I'll you know, ask move to Antimo, but I will give you a final shot. Just have a little think if there's any aspect of your life as a PhD student that we haven't covered. I'll give you a chance to come in with that at the end. But Antimo, if I can move, ask you to unmute and ask you that same question about what aspect of a PhD student do you find most challenging? Most okay, most challenging. So uh, first of all, the bro, the, the the fact that the theme can be very broad. I guess that I've met many friends that are PhD students, and many of us tend to overestimate what they can do in three or four years. That is at least my experience. That that is what happened to me as well. So one very challenging thing is to uh, try to conceive, to realistically conceive what you can do in those in those years. Then, of course, you may have may get a postdoc, but that's another thing. So, and of course, this is like an organizational issue. Uh, the technical issues that I can mention are, first of all, trying to um, clarify what the relationship of the human being to eternity can be, and how these, uh, the fact, I know that I'm going to say something which will seem very weird, the fact that in some sense we are eternal, but of course this should be explained, does not really contradict our finitude as uh, beings that have a limited time uh, and that of course will die. So that is two technical issues and uh, one challenging organizational one. Super. Uh, my, my final question for you, Antimo, is around sort of what was we heard earlier from the panel about sort of um, enrichment and enhancement activities, you know, perhaps, you know, presenting or getting involved in, in peer learning or student activities. Have you had any experience of that? The obscure activities. Well, sort of these, these sort of the ex, you know, these sort of enrichment activities, so student conferences or groups or presenting for in sure. some environment. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I, I participated, for instance, uh, in one very interesting seminar held by students at SUS, so by PhD students, which was called Ideas in Common, and I would that I would like to resurrect in the near future because it's finished. Uh, where ev everybody had the occasion to just summarize their own research without having to present a too polished paper, for instance, that may be of help. So that is one of the activities that I participated in. Mm. 
Thank you. And so just final to Mona, in case there's anything else you felt we didn't cover, is there any other activities you felt that we haven't covered that form part of your life as a PhD student? Yes, I mean, it's really important, I think, for everyone to understand that in your PhD, the opportunities that you do take on, the enriching opportunities, presenting your work and so on and so forth, does not have to be extremely exclusive to what your your research is about. So I've taken on um, assisting research roles in preserving cultural heritage, for example, which has a little bit to do with the area of my research, but not the subject itself. And that has helped me a lot in trying to understand where my career or what my career might look like post PhD. It opens up a lot of anyways. Um, so yeah, I can work in cultural protection or cultural preservation now because I took on that opportunity. And the only reason I got the opportunity is because I'm a PhD student and I have research skills. So you need to be very open in venturing out in other areas and don't be too worried about it may be interfering with your PhD because for me it was a great break, mind break, um, to be able to think about someone else's research rather than my own. Um, and it gets me excited to circle back and come back to my own material. So yeah, working while doing your PhD is always a plus, never a minus, I think. So it's such a positive note. So we're going to hear from Mona and Antimo again at the end of the session. But, you know, you've both given me some very some some excellent pivot points into the next part. And I also want to to thank everybody in the chat box. So I was keeping an eye on the chat box as we were talking and seeing multiple messages per minute. So we're going to give um, Antimo and Mona a chance to sort of read through the chat box and reflect. And 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 then you, I'll invite you back in in about some 20 minutes or so to give your final thoughts in response to what's what students saw or skills they saw as you described your PhD. Thank you both very much. Right, while they do that, I'm then going to sort of pick up on some of these themes about um, narrative. And I think that one of the reasons that we do this is that um, I hope as you heard them talk about their research, and thank you, Mattis, that you heard some things that resonated you. It could have been you in that seat. I could have been asking you those questions. You know, perhaps, you know, sometimes you could, you know, buddy up, ask each other those conversations, because the first thing is for you to identify those skills for yourself. First, you articulate to yourself the awareness. Then you can create the narrative. Once we're aware of something, then it's in our consciousness, we can start seeing how we can tweak, change, influence it. So here's an, here's an example that somebody is going, oh, actually, I realize I have to be so organized to do my PhD. Um, and, and then, you know, once you've got that, then you can start looking about how you can quantify and present that PhD to others. Often you, the people who will be reading your CV, listening to your interview answers, they won't have a PhD. They know you're very clever and a bit scary, but they don't know what you've just done. And therefore actually being able to explain to them that what it is, you know, how long it takes that for most of you, I'd expect it, you know, um, either a four year full time or I will have part time PhD students in the room. So, you know, you may have been doing your PhD alongside a full time job, in which case you have my huge respect. And then they won't know how long your dissertation is, and they won't know that you then have to defend it to experts. Um, and so therefore, um, you know, articulating it to yourself, then you can work out how we explain it to others. So for example, some of you will be filling in an application form. I can see some, some chat um, about um, heritage opportunities in the in the chat box. Often they look for project management, and you need to describe your skill, your project management skills, as you've honed them from the PhD. And also, you may bring them from your other parts of your your life, your work experience, your experience prior to your PhD. But how, whatever you draw on, then numbers add punch. And you can notice that in this, I've picked out three numbers you know, how many sources, one of the things I, you know, you picked up from both Mona and Antimo was the range of 
evidence. You know, cha- as soon as you change talking about text to say, actually, you're looking for evidence. And evidence is a much more pliable word than text as you move it, you know, out you know, beyond the, the um, humanities academia. It's just saying 500 academic sources and people just go, oh, really? Making sense of big data then? And then the fact that you can work right coherently at length. I think one of the first skills that went into the chatbot was writing skills. And you're putting that in terms of an, an impressive output. So, yeah, certainly um, at the end of this session, um, to William and Claire's question, I'll say a little bit more about where you can find out resources about where to find about different jobs. Great questions. Thank you. So your skill base is broader than your PhD. We're leaning in um, hard to your PhD because we know that that's what you'll all have in common in this in this room. And we've heard a lot from our alumni panel about not only your PhD study, but what I'm calling your academic enhancement CV lines. And we heard from Ant- Antimo's experience of presenting um, and how, um, how that becomes part of your PhD experience. Anything you do during the PhD um, is Um, is comes part of your PhD CV line and can be presented as part of what you did during this period of professional and academic developmental time. But also for many of you, and I know certainly Mark within the humanities, we we often have people who've worked for a while and then come back to academia to do their PhD. We saw that reflected on our panel. Um, And also many of you who are doing volunteering or you've got caring responsibilities. All of these can be mined for skills. But particularly, I think what I see when I look at PhD CVs is that often people don't deconstruct their academic enhancement CV lines. So some of you are working on publications, many of you will have an opportunity to present. And if you're not, then I think Antimo's given us some really good inspiration there about a student organized conference. I know my SAS students are putting together their student conference for, for June. So if there aren't presenting opportunities, then create presenting opportunities with your fellow students. Some of you will have experience of teaching, and some of you will be involved in politics. And Mona was talking about an op- you know, the opportunity that part-time work can offer to this. But many of you, and I know particularly those of you are slightly more on, on the sort of social science end, you know, there may be, there are charities you're involved in where you're helping with projects. And often people sort of think that public, you know, it speaks for themselves. They don't say, well, actually, what skills did I develop through um, teaching? But often through these academic enhancement lines, you develop some of these skills. Look at some of these descriptions, you know, a balanced approach to risk. Well, that's very much when you're putting together a publication, you know, you're you're assessing how you, you know, how you can present it so it's likely to get um, accepted. Often in teaching, you're experimenting. Um, you're often in projects you have to be solution orientated. Now, I took those descriptions from Investors in People, which is talks about the key qualities for success in the modern working world. So again, you broaden your description. Often people's descriptions of their experiences is too pedestrian. And sometimes what you need to do is enrich um, your language. So many of you will be used, you will come across the term STAR, particularly in applications at interviews, where someone says, can you give me um, an example? Thank you, Connie, for for getting the link for the SAS student conference. Mm. And what people often do is they don't give enough detail on the actions that they took and they don't quantify it with a result. a result. Now, this was inspired by some work done by my SAS students. So my SAS students in the space may, may remember this. And I use that as the inspiration for this example that I um, created. But again, you know, um, you're showing where you use your skills to have impact on a problem. It goes back to that point about being solution focused. And I think that that 
to again, and I keep coming back to that great question, how do I present my PhD as work experience to a non-academic audience? You should you present your, C, your PhD experience as a series of problems that you had to solve, both academically and those things you're doing as your part of your wider identity as a PhD student. So you show me what problem you were solving, the range of approaches you took to solve it, um, and you know, preferably using skills that link to the job description, and then you give me a result. And I'm seeing some great encouragement in the chat box. Thank you. I particularly wanted to highlight digital skills. And I will just put my hand up here. You know, my first degrees in classics, you know, half of which it was history. You know, my academic interests are deep into the humanities. And basically, Digital stuff is just too important to leave to the scientists. You know, that we have had um, humanities be put in digital from the almost the con early conception of digital. And particularly because of those literal, um, those, those linguistic analytical skills. And so I think it's, and what I have noticed as a trend is people almost self identifying themselves out and going, oh, tech, it's something to do with electronics. I've never really liked maths. It's not my arena. Now, I hope that that's not the case for many of you. I know I will have people in the room who will have a very proud identity around the digital humanities. But I do think it's important to say, I'm in a room of PhD students. You have all got digital skills. You are probably underselling them. And actually, you have to claim your digital skill profile and flaunt it all over your CVs and applications. So some questions to ask yourself, and I'd really invite you to type into the chat box some of the packages that you use. And we saw some of it came out earlier when we were talking to Mona and Po, which is what digital skills are you using to support your evidence analysis in documentation, to raise your profile, to keep yourself organized, um, here in SAS, a lot of us are real Pomodoro fans. What, you know, how are you taking advantage of digital learning facilities? So thank you, Mona's typed in about social media. So I'm just going to give you a moment to think about that um, and, and say that I do think it is a way in which I observe if we're not careful, we will disempower and disenfranchise our valuable perspective away from the modern world, which I think not only has impact on us as workers, but also has impact on us as citizens. So, nice. Excellent question from Connie. Would I bullet point them or would I give examples for all of them? It rather depends on the job ad. Um, so I'd probably, on digital skills, I would probably both give a list of packages because I think that that sends a signal that you are very happy to learn new packages because that's one of the digital skills is the ability to think oh I need this to do that and to learn it quickly and I'm sure many of you will have had that experience suddenly in order to do something you needed to master a new tool so that meta learning which is very part and part of of digital skills, but also I would look, to, I would do both. I don't think it's an and or. I would also, you know, look um, for ways of building into the bullet points. And I'd probably, every so often, I'd mention the word digital. It's a signal of modernity. So just like numbers, you know, my two tips for CVs, if someone says, I said, I'll tell you how to see, improve your CV by 5%, add four numbers and put the word in digital somewhere in the bullet point. And I think that's because it's about semiotics and it's lovely to be in a room where I can use the term semiotics um, in a relaxed fashion that, you know, that we are sending signals about our attitude to the world. And our world's got quite a lot of myths and discourse around digitality at the moment. And we need to make sure that we are taking a strong position in that. Fantastic. There's some great lists of packages, photos, and things and absolutely and i just want to thank you to seeing sophie and the seal putting in about zoom that ability to present um as we are today we're all entirely digital that ability to present digitally to be comfortable in the way that you are engaging with the chat box and this really relaxed and um cooperative and information rich way is an example of real digital comfort And 
So, okay, so we've identified the skills. We're starting to reskin them and re and really enrich how we talk about them. And then you need to practice. And, you know, I am threatening to get a SAS careers T-shirt with this on it. You know, when you are a PhD student, you don't look like a stalker. And there was a lovely point that, that, that you know, Mona made earlier about, you know, I got that job because I was a PhD student. You know, th there is still um, an attitude of it, of, I think, goodwill to people improving themselves through education, which is what you're doing as a student. And so, and also you, you look long, um, less threatening because again, um, universities, that there is an aura that they are, and to some extent, respectable, benign institutions. So if somebody says, I am a student at so-and-so institution, uh, you know, I'm interested in finding more about your organization, you are more likely to get a positive response than if they have no place to sort of anchor you. And clearly, if you're doing a PhD student, you're not necessarily immediately looking for a job. Um, and so therefore, do not waste this window when actually doors are slightly more open to you and people are less on the defensive to have conversations. And, you know, you should have exploratory conversations you know, where you're finding things out. There's this lovely phrase about, you know, in a spirit of inquiry. You can have confirmatory conversations where you check out your perceptions. And also you can practice describing your PhD in relevant ways. And for some of you, like Mona with her interviews, this may be very similar to the sort of conversations and interviewing you're doing as part of your PhD. And the more you have conversations, you know, outside the interview room, then the better you will perform inside the interview room. So... And the first step, as first step I would suggest you for that is actually start with people you know already. So many people have reservations about um, talking to strangers. Um, and so that, therefore, um, think about who you know already and ask them different questions. So if it's your supervisor and you've been focusing very much on your longer term career development, you know, your, or your um, research, then take an opportunity to talk about your longer term career development, set a separate meeting and say, I'm halfway through my PhD now, I'd just like to talk to you about that. I, I find that often people say to me, they only talk to their supervisor about their PhD. And that's a bit of a missed opportunity. Again, you know, make sure you've got your cheerleading network, and that you've got that you are exploring yeah, say to them, I'm exploring new options. Can I run? Can I run for my thinking past you? Will you cheer me on a bit? And and at this time of transition, that you're getting a bit of a support network um, to make that pivot. That was something that came up earlier. I think some of the questions people are asking speakers about what helped you make that change. And then also, some of you have got you know. Um, we've worked somewhere before, you pick up with colleagues or fellow students who are now working in organisations of interest to you, reach out and don't necessarily say, what do you think I could do? Set, ask some questions about how their organisation is changing. One of the legacies of COVID is that people got a lot more comfortable with Zoom coffees. So it's much more normal to say, oh, you know, could you spend 30 minutes on Zoom with me? And people are more used to fitting that into their schedule. And again, that opens doors, doors for you. So again, in terms of selling your skills, then it's, it's, it's certainly the case that this sort of practice, practicing those conversations will, first of all, improve your discourse. Um, well, for many people, talking about it generates new ideas. And also when people see you approaching it that way, it, they may often suggest use of resources. I'm really um, in, interested to see all the sort of positive encouragements going to the chat box and people saying, oh, here's an idea. That's a very natural human instinct. As soon as you create a safe non-threatening space often people will then people like solving problems it's often easier to solve other people's problems so as long as they don't feel that they are in some ways need to be on the defensive then often people will come in with ideas 
It's a great question from Sophie. Would you ask for a Zoom meeting to a new contact to explain an internship opportunity? So I think prob probably, um, again, I, I would probably start by doing my doing my research into the organisation. I'd start by finding out more about the organisation um, and the sort of skills required, and then and then say to them, you know, do into opposite coming off. Have you got any advice? So I'd have a number of asks, which to avoid making them feel they're put on the spot, because actually what you want most of all is insights. Um, a, from any conversation, you can get insights and insights make it more lock, likely that you will both uncover opportunities and apply for them effectively. So here is a phrase um, that what I observe is people like people who are forward facing, positive and coherent. So for those of you who are looking to pivot into a new area, here is a phrase for you. I am developing my expertise in X in response to changes in Y, and I am looking for contacts and experience in Z. You know, your end of a PhD is a natural pivot point, and some of these conversations can really smooth that pivot. Right, we're coming towards the end of our time, and so I'm just going to invite Mona and Antimo back. Um, Starting with Antimo, having read the chat box, is there anything, you know, you just give us some, some response and thoughts? For sure, for sure. So um, I've read two words that, at least according to me, I'm not an alumnus yet. I hope you will invite me later <laughs> in the near future. But <laughs> so uh, take my opinion as an opinion of still a PhD, of still a PhD student. So I've read two words, ambition, from Mirko and flexibility from Jose. I think these are two of the main skills. Why? For instance, also thanks to Leeds and to my ambition in some sense, uh, I've managed to, I don't know, get three jobs. Uh, one of them is at the Brilliant Club. So I'm teaching my own courses that I self-designed uh, in high schools in London, so in secondary schools in London, so thanks to Leeds. And also I'm doing, I'm working as a private tutor um, for, for, a com for a private company. I guess that doing something alongside with the PhD is really what can help after the PhD. The more we do, uh, the best we do, after the PhD, I think. I've been seeing many PhD students afraid of doing something else at the same time because of anxiety about the PhD. Some, sometimes it's also uh, our supervisor's fault uh, to make us feel anxious, but I guess that doing something alongside with the PhD for the whole duration of it or so uh, may, be of, may be of particular help. Super. And how about you, Mona? Any responses in the chat box? Any final thoughts you want to share? Yes. Um, Josephine asked um, to just run you guys through how I got my job in Heritage. So I'll do that very quickly. And I've pulled up the, um, the job description just to give me some notes. Um, so essentially, I got sent a, a text via Twitter from one of my previous professors um, for an opportunity to teach Arabic at a university. But I'm not very into language teaching if it wasn't English. Um, however, the link was at Jobs Academia. And on the sidebar, you could see all of the jobs that had listed Arabic as a desirable or an essential skill. Um, so I did find this opportunity at a um, digital archive that's in Oxford University. And they, are collecting like photographs of archaeological sites and things like that. And they listed Arabic as desirable to help them collect more photographs and connect with more photographers in the local areas of North Africa and Middle East, which is their focus. So I had regional expertise. I had the linguistic expertise, but I am by no means an archaeologist at all, nor do I wish to become one. Um, but I wrote the application anyway, and I did send it through just because the worst thing that could happen is you get rejected. 
which isn't harmful if you get rejected. It, you got the experience of writing that cover letter. You got the experience of, you know, revising your CV and seeing how can this CV be transformed into something that this organization might accept. Um, but thankfully, I did get an interview. And the first thing they asked is, you're not an archaeologist, and why did you apply? And my response was essentially that I had the linguistic ability to do what a information collector, let's say in English, would do in a month. I could, I would be able to do that in a week because I can research in the language of the locals that you're trying to reach. And I think that's what sold them. So yes, job at academia, filter it by part time, and then just put in that specific skill that you have, and it could take you into opportunities that you never thought you'd be in before. And another thing that I saw in the chat box was asking questions. Yes, always ask questions. I worked for an archive and the first thing I asked was, can I oversee a, um, an application for funding? Because that's something I wouldn't be able to see at PhD. So a large grant, for example, from the AHRC, how they do the budget plans and things like that. I really wanted to see how they would develop that spreadsheet. Um, what budgeting do they put in place? staff costs for example what other things would they put in from for like future reference maybe i would like to apply for a large grant for one of my projects in the future and that would be that was really valuable information that i got from the organization so yes ask questions again the the worst thing that could happen is you either get rejected or no response or a no and it's not that harmful so yeah that's all I wanted to say. And one last note is think of your PhD as a project. So when someone does ask if you have project management skills, you manage your PhD. You worked with your supervisors to make sure that it was a, a great project and it was complete in the end and you could de defend it in a viva. So by all means, yes, you have managed a project before. Yep. Thank you, super. And, you know, thank you. You know, thank you both. And also for the for the absolute courage of being interviewed about your PhD live in front of over 100 people. I'm sure a lot there'll be a lot of appreciation in the chat box. And we can tell by the com conversation that you stimulated. Thank you for the generosity in sort of, you know, of, of participating in this and some really, really great great points and also thank you for for all the comments that are going into the chat box so i'm going to draw this to a close and i will be addressing the job sites issue which is coming up quite a lot in the the chat back box and also the union membership issue that's coming up in the chat box but just to summarize you know your phd is a lifelong asset what i so often see and i've been working in this space now for over 30 years is people do their phd there is often, you know, it is often a career pivot um, and there is often, you know, a couple of tricky, slightly bitty years. That's a common pathway. And then the people find themselves, you are bright, skilled people. People find their starter. I'm mean, find Kean's um, honesty about his journey. Um, really, really inspiring. But don't we all think we're just we're talking to a future ambassador? You know, he said, I want to work in the Irish for, for so, so I thought I'm following your, your career for the next 20 years. So what you often see is, you know, there may be a dip and it can be very hard, but I know many, many PhD career pathways and often those skills that you have developed will, you know, they, they pay back later. And some of you will end up back in the academy because we have an increasing pattern of people coming back into the academy later in their career. And in order to navigate that bit of a roller coaster as smoothly as possible, the key seems to be extracting the skills and creating the narrative, doing the extras as both our panel and our students have highlighted about those extra opportunities to give you extra contacts and skills that actually, if you've got your academic assets, they're useful both for those of you who are using them to apply for academic careers, but also are evidence of achievement for broader ranges of, of career and I would say we live in a big data, multi-digital world. So the skills you're developing through of evidence analysis and digital skills are increasingly important. We will be circulating the sides, but what I want to do, and I can see people need to move on, you know, come into a close, is to, for you to think about all the things you've heard today and type into the chat box, what's your next step? in developing and communicating your transferable skills from your PhD. 
And I'll give you a minute to do that. And, and while you do that, I'm going to put our feedback form in the chat box. Now, when I do this, people say, oh, people, you know, people are fed up with feedback forms. They don't fill them in. So the last time I did it, I managed to get 40. That was from the discipline of English. Now, surely language, cultures and society can beat English when it comes to filling in feedback forms. We do. Um, we do read them all. We do use them to shape the things that that what I heard from English was one of the reasons that I um, um, showcased the question on pay because that, you know, people said, you know, we want to ask the hard stuff. So do, you know, we don't mind what you write, but we do value your feedback. We're always trying to um, develop our service for our PhD students. And as the School of Advanced Study, it is our mission to broaden that beyond our own boundaries. So it's lovely to have so many of you here from so many institutions. And it's a long haul. So this is from one of my PhD graduates. And she said, you know, both career development and your PhD are big projects. So keep a list of progress so that you can see that process. You're going to enrich the world. Whatever roles you do, just as our PhD alumni are, there are, are opportunities. The mention, you know, someone saying if you are looking at um, higher education, they're referencing our main union, which is USU, in any environment, it is worth looking to see uh, both unions and professional associations to make sure that you are part of a working community. That's good practice in any field. Um, and so, and that's, and for those of you who are saying, where can I find um, job vacancies? You are all linked with universities. They all have a career service. They will all have a career service website. We all list resources. So if you are struggling, about how it, finding out resources, then I would encourage you to check out your university or DPTP career service. As postgraduates, you also have access to VTI. And there's also a great American Canadian resource called imaginephd.com. So, so, so I would I would say that if you are struggling, um, even if you don't, you know, I mean, I would hope for many of you, you would have a positive um experience your career service. Often having written worked in many career services, we have to work quite hard, hard to make our PhD student realize that we're there for them as well as our undergraduates. And also for many UK universities, you often are entitled to use our services, just is, is true in my institution, for two years after you finish. So there was a, a cluster of you which say, oh, I'm in that stage where um, I've I've completed my viva, congratulations, but I'm in the correction stage, no man's land, then it's quite likely you still fall under the umbrella of your career support. We are one of the services that stretches on often after um, graduation. So what would be my, my main signpost um, to those? Um, and also, um, for many of you interested um, in the Heritage injury and the other things. I, you know, I again, um, there are there are many resources out there, and I'm just going. There's, I'm going to put one in the chat box just to get you started. Typical careers consultant, you just can't bear to let people go out without a web, without some sort of source. But the thing called target jobs. Again, you many of you will find that things. If you Google that, they've got resources on getting into heritage and many other areas as well. But as I say, your own career service will be able to enrich that. So we've come to the end of our time. So the feedback form is on the whole day. So I'm expecting you to give the panelists gold stars, um, but things so do give us comments on all of it. We want to know what you've learned. And if I can just um, finish by thanking you all for, for such fabulous engagement in the chat box. You make these events. And I, I've just really enjoyed the comradeship, the encouragement um, and the authenticity that I've seen in your contributions. So I'd like to draw this to a close by wishing you every success in your PhD with a particular cheer on for those of you battling through corrections. I'd like to wish you every success with your career development and really encourage you to reach back to your university career service and for their um, support and their resources, as well as your graduate school. Yeah. 
but also in this challenging time for the world, I'd like to wish you and your family good health and prosperity. Thank you for spending the afternoon to us. A big thank out for my students and Naomi and Kathy who have organised this event. I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you.